So much brutality has emerged from Marx-inspired activists. We could think it's just an accidental byproduct of well-intentioned theory. Or is it really a necessary and intended consequence of its principles? To begin, what, what do I mean by the long history of brutality? One indicator of this is the sad and enormous death toll in the Marxist communist societies of the 20th century. So Soviet Russia, the Soviet Union, 62 million people killed. China, 77 million people killed. And when we're talking about the killing here, we're talking about democide, democide defined as the killing of citizens by their own government. So that excludes cases of civil war, it excludes all kinds of international war. So there are no war deaths included in these numbers. Soviet Union's approximate 62 and communist China 77 million. Smaller countries, Cambodia, 2 million people killed, famous for its killing fields. Vietnam, 1.7 million people, and a longer list of communist regimes. Now, that's communist practice, but what about the theory? We have to make a connection here. So it's natural to start with a series of quotations from some of the principal figures. And let's go right back to the founding fathers, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. They are famous, of course, for their co-authored 1848 Communist Manifesto, a political tract. But here's Marx in 1848, not in Communist Manifesto, but contemporary saying, quote, there's only one way in which the murderous death agonies of the old society and the bloody birth throes of the new society can be shortened, simplified, and concentrated. And that way is revolutionary terror. Uh, let me say by, by a side note here that all of the sources for the quotations and sometimes charts and so on that I mentioned along the way They'll be at my website uh, with with a link to the podcast file. Now, here's Engels a year later, 1849, uh, talking about the next world war, kind of longing for it to occur. And and, uh, here's what he has to say about it. Quote, The next world war will result in the disappearance from the face of the earth, not only of reactionary classes and dynasties, but also of entire reactionary peoples. And that, too, is a step forward." Unquote. Now, those are the founding fathers of Marxism. It seems quite clear that they see violence and terror, the disappearance from the face of the earth of whole peoples as built into what they are talking about. Now, Marxism was in the doldrums, both theoretically and as a movement through much of the late 1980s, but it was revived in the early 20th century by the success of the Russian Revolution. So we can look at the 20th century revolutionaries, particularly the successful ones, and their understanding of what bringing Marxist theory into practice requires. So here's Vladimir Lenin. Uh, 1917, at the beginning of the Russian Revolution, stating forthrightly, quote, The state is an instrument for coercion. We want to organize violence in the name of the interests of the workers, unquote. Three years later, consolidating power, quote, A good communist is at the same time a good Czechist, unquote. Now, historical reminder, Cheka were the early at Soviet Russia's political police force, and they had sweeping powers of arrest and detainment, including the right to torture and execute people on the spot when they judged necessary, which frankly was rather often. And here's uh, Felix Jerzinski, the Cheka chief in 1918, when they're getting some blowback from how violent and brutal their methods are. Quote, the public and the press misunderstand the character and tasks of our commission. We stand for organized terror. This should be frankly stated. 
being absolutely dis indispensable in the current revolutionary conditions. All right, that's early in the uh, Russian Revolution, a generation later. Leon Trotsky, no stranger himself to revolutionary violence, speaking uh, ruefully, admiringly about Joseph Stalin. This is in 1940. Stalin had consolidated power after the death of Lenin. And here's Trotsky's assessment of Stalin. Quote, under all conditions, well-organized violence seems to him the shortest distance between two points, unquote. So what we have then is fairly strong connections between what the Marxist theoreticians, including the founding fathers, said and what their political activists in practice did. All of them are forthrightly claiming the necessary use of violence, terror, and so on. And this, of course, is uh, also reflected in the large number of West uh, intellectuals, rather, in the West, even after they became aware of the atrocities in the Russian Revolution and all of the other communist regimes, but they were quite blasé or forthrightly accepting right, of them. So I'm going to just take uh, one Eric Hobsbawm as an exemplar here. He was an academic historian at Cambridge University, Burbeck University of London, lived a long, very comfortable life in England, justifying the theory and practice of communism. 1994, he's now an older man. He's being interviewed for the Highbrow Times Literary Supplement. And he's uh, you know, being asked about the huge death toll, the killings of millions of Russian citizens under Stalin. Hobsbawm says, well, it was, quote, probably excessive, unquote. But he went on to say that all of that killing really would have been worth it if true communism had resulted. Mass killings, fine, as long as we get communism out of it. And that's not uh, to go through the long list of the Marx-inspired terrorist groups of the 20th century, the Red Army faction in Germany, Italy's Red Brigades, the Japanese Red Army, terrorist groups up and down Latin America, and so forth, all of them very willing to use, in many cases, indiscriminate violence in order to bring about what they hoped would be a revolution. So there's a pattern. We uh, really have three options when we step back and try to explain the pattern. One is to say, well, just a coincidence. Second is to say, well, communism, though, in theory, it's uh, humane and has uh, great ideals, but somehow its practitioners misinterpreted Marx and or when they tried to put things into practice unintentionally, things just got out of control and all the violence occurred. Third option, this is the one that I think is true, Communism is a theory that calls explicitly for terrorism and the extermination of large numbers of people. And this is going to be not merely as a matter of political expediency that is built into the philosophy from the beginning, and necessarily so. That's going to be part of a general theme of my podcast series, this theme that philosophy is impractical. Philosophy does have a reputation for being highly abstract, and of course it can be head in the clouds, ivory tower, distant from practical concerns. But the claim I'm going to make is that no matter how theoretical those claims and issues are philosophically, how one answers those issues makes a difference practically. Abstract claims in metaphysics, in epistemology, and so forth, when they are applied consistently, become literally life and death in practice. And I mean that not just social media, literally, I mean literally, literally. And Marxism is a very clear case study of this. In his book, Entrepreneurial Living, 15 stories of innovation, risk and achievement, and one story of abject failure, Professor Stephen Hicks has put together a series of interviews with entrepreneurs from six different countries and seven U.S. states to explore the adventure and the hard-headedness of business. In this book, Hicks explores what makes for entrepreneurial success and failure. To what extent does success depend on the key decisions, ideas, persistent action or character traits? How does one's business life fit into one's overall life? And how does one even define success? Our belief is that we can always learn from the accomplishments and setbacks of others. The life stories from others can be informative, cautionary and inspirational as we each strive to more fully realize our own potentials and achieve our own goals. 
The 16 entrepreneurs featured in this book are widespread geographically as well as in the range of their endeavors, from sports to education, to fashion, to technology, to finance, to advertising, to architecture, to cosmetics, and more. Observation of success and failure is often the best way to avoid pitfalls, learning from the mistakes of others to get on the pathway to success. This book doesn't disappoint, providing engaging and useful insights from the accounts of 16 entrepreneurs whose reflections are both personal to them and timeless in their significance for the rest of us. Pick up your copy of Entrepreneurial Living, 15 Stories of Innovation, Risk and Achievement, and One Story of Abject Failure by Stephen Hicks on Amazon.com. And while you're online, please leave a review for the Open College Podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. Now, if we go to relatively uh, early Marx, this is Marx of the Communist Manifesto, 1848, nonetheless mature. Most of us are familiar with the main themes of that work. It's a class analysis. Marxism always takes any society and divides it or, and analyzes it in terms of its class structure. So feudalism has a variety of classes. Some of those classes have more power, less power than others. So uh, capitalism fits right into this as well with its two classes, the bourgeoisie, who are the property owners and thereby richer and more powerful, the proletariat, who don't have any property and therefore are weaker in that system and have to work for the capitalists or they are dispossessed even from any sort of employment at all and so are very much weaker. These two main classes are in conflict with each other. The conflict is a zero-sum one. That's to say there's always a winner and a loser. But because of their power, the rich property owners, the bourgeoisie, are in a position to exploit and extract wealth from the proletariat. Capitalism, therefore, is a, an immoral system, but because of its internal conflicts that are going to break out into contradictions, eventually it will become unstable. And some sort of communist version of socialism is not only a future ideal, but a necessary result of the analysis. There's always a question, though, when we think about the Marxist theory, uh, about why the Marxists are rejecting explicitly achieving socialism by democratic and reformist methods. Why are they insisting in this work and others of the time upon violent revolution? Because there is already in the modern world a longish history. Uh, we can go back 100 years, say, to uh, even to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who started publishing in the 1740s. The most socialists then, some of them were more violent than others, but many of them were uh, reformist or democratic or republican uh, in their advocacy of the methods by which one would bring about socialism. But Marxism is very forthright in rejecting all of that and, uh, and arguing that terroristic and violent methods are necessary. One kind of reason can be more psychological. You know, we can try to imagine if we're trying to bring about socialism through political processes that are democratic or republican, that's going to push on our patience buttons pretty hard. And so it might just be that we are very impatient because we know that if we're going to be successful in those systems, that is to say a democratic republic of some sort, well, the first thing that we have to do is get organized. And that, that takes time, as we all know, to organize a movement, even a merely an intellectual movement. And suppose we try to uh, get ourselves organized, and we do, and so we start uh, entering the electoral process. Well, we know we're going to lose a lot of elections at first several rounds of elections. And then maybe we will start to win some elections, but we're going to be a minority in the, the lower legislative chamber, the House of Representatives or Parliament or whatever it is. Now suppose uh, after several more elections, we get a majority in the lower chamber. But then we know there's divisions of power, there's an upper chamber, and whatever socialist legislation we pass in the lower chamber, it's just going to be vetoed by those in the upper chamber, the Senate or the House of Lords or whatever it's called. Maybe eventually, after several more elections and more work, we're going to get a majority in the upper chamber too. 
but then our bills are just going to be vetoed by the president or the prime minister or the judiciary or whoever the top dog uh, institutions are going to be. At the same time, if we're going to be successful in democratic republics, we have to get the education establishment on our side. We have to get the journalistic establishments on our side. But we know that in a free democratic republic, many of those are going to be against socialism or they're just very slowly going to become reformist. Now, even if we overcome as socialists all of those obstacles, we still have to remember that the rich bourgeoisie will have concentrated huge amounts of resources in their hands. They'll have lots of money available to them. And the capitalists and their lackeys, they're just going to bribe whomever they need to in order to stay in power. So all of the extra legal sources of power inside a democratic republic are still going to be available and we're going to be up against those. Or if uh, bribery is not sufficient, then they will just use the police and or the military to suppress any threats coming from socialist quarters. So if you're a socialist, and especially imagine yourself as a relatively young socialist with a burning desire to see socialism actually happen, well, I mean, who has the patience to endure all of that? Now, Communist Manifesto, it's a political tract, but it's important to interpret it in the context of Karl Marx's broader philosophy. And here it's very important to remember that Marx is not merely a political activist. He is a PhD, and his PhD is in philosophy. So he is famous for his political economy, but he developed it explicitly in the context of an entire philosophy. When we start looking at Marxist philosophy, we realize that in addition to and even more strongly than impatience, there's a strong philosophical reason that Marxism embraces that leads it to rule out on principle any sort of democratic reformism. That reason is environmental determinism. Now, by determinism, I mean right, the thesis that human beings do not control their thoughts, actions, destinies. They are instead subject to divine forces, biological forces, or environmental forces beyond their control that shape them and ultimately cause their destiny to be whatever it is. So that is to say, human beings do not have volition, they don't have free will, they don't have a capacity for self-control or self-development. The individual is not the power that bees. Instead, we are created and we act on the basis of forces beyond one's control, right? whether those powerful forces are divine, biological, environmental, or, or some controversial uh, combination rather of those. Now, Marxism takes a very strong environmental thesis, except as a kind of a malleable potential. There is no such thing as a human nature. Now, here's a direct quote from the early Marx, Marx, the philosopher of the time. Quote, the human essence has no true reality, unquote. Human beings are consequently to be seen as a plastic or plasticine, to be brought into the world as malleable and shapeable by their circumstances. Now, here's another formulation direct from the Marx of the time. Quote, it is not the consciousness of men that determines their lives, unquote. And I want to pause on, on that for a moment. That is to say, it's not your consciousness. That is to say, you don't think, consider, deliberate, weighs pros and cons, then make a decision, and then decide to put that into practice uh, through a volitional initiative, and on the basis of that, determine what your life is going to be. No, Marx is going to argue that it's the other way around. Right? Quote, on the contrary, their social being determines their consciousness, unquote. The word social is important in that quotation because for Marx, the determining environmental circumstances are fundamentally social. Marx sees individuals as vehicles of social collectives. We are not an autonomous individual who is born into, say, a family, a city, a nation, an ethnicity, or whatever. Nonetheless, as an autonomous individual, you can control your thoughts, make your own decisions, put them into action, make your own character, your life, and so forth. Instead, you're a vehicle through which the social units that you are born into mold you and create you. Uh, Marx, the philosopher, again, early, quote, activity and mind are social in their content as well as in their origin. They are a social activity, and 
social mind, unquote. Again, here's another one. The individual, quote, exists in reality as the representation and the real mind of social existence. So that is to say, you as an individual are a representation of a society's existence. Longer quotation here, but an important and pregnant one. Quote, though man is a unique individual, and it is just his particularity which makes him an individual, a really individual communal being, he is equally the whole, the ideal whole, the subjective existence of society as thought and experience. He exists in reality as the representation and the real mind of social existence and as the sum of human manifestations of life, unquote. That's a clear statement that your individual being is to be a vehicle through which social forces operate. You are a representation of sociability. Further, according to Marx's philosophy, it's not just your social circumstances in general. It is more specifically your economic circumstances that are the fundamental social environmental forces creating you. Again, Marx's words, for example. These ones are from a little bit later, Das Kapital. Quote, as individuals express their life, so they are. What they are, therefore, coincides with their production, both with what they produce and with how they produce. The nature of individuals thus depends on the material conditions determining their production, unquote. So putting all that together, what we have is Marxism is committed to collective economic determinism. Anyone's belief system is a necessary consequence of their economic social being. What one thinks is true, reasonable, good, is determined by the economic circumstances in which one is raised. In Stephen Hicks's book, Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism and Socialism from Rousseau to Foucault, he writes an incredibly crafted and well-argued insight into what postmodernism is, why it exists, and why it is dangerous applied in the wrong dose, in the wrong place, as it frequently is in this day and age. Postmodernism has been the most vigorous intellectual movement of the late 20th century. In his book, Hicks traces the roots of postmodernism all the way back to the Enlightenment era, where he systematically charts how the age of reason sowed the seeds of unreason that was to follow, making a clear connection between postmodernism to history, leftist politics, and even the ugliness of contemporary art. Hicks presents his thesis with beautiful, easy-to-understand explanations that burn with logic and common sense. So if you've ever wondered why society holds so many assumptions about the world, and you want to understand the chaos of what is happening, Hicks's work in this book provides a huge piece to this puzzle. Why do sceptical and relativistic arguments have such power in the contemporary intellectual world? Why do they have that power in the humanities but not in the sciences? Why is a significant portion of the political left the same left that traditionally promoted reason, science, equality for all and optimism now switch to the themes of anti-reason, anti-science, double standards and cynicism? This book is by far the most helpful resource I have ever come across for understanding why the world is turning into a direction that I just can't comprehend. Pick up your copy of Stephen Hicks's book, Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism and Socialism from Rousseau to Foucault, available now on Amazon.com. While you're online, make sure to subscribe to the Open College podcast hosted by Stephen Hicks himself, and please leave a review for it on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. What does this comply for understanding the capitalist economic system in particular? Now, we know from before, Marx holds that capitalism divides people into polarized economic classes, bourgeoisie and the proletariat. The more important point here is going to be that the members of the two classes are born and raised in fundamentally different and opposed economic circumstances. So again, a quotation from Marx, quote, in proportion as capital accumulates, the lot of the laborer must grow worse. Accumulation of wealth at one pole is at the same time accumulation of misery at the opposite pole. 
All right, that's a restatement of the rich get richer, poor get poorer, the two polarized classes thesis, and that they are in zero-sum conflict with each other. Now, this set of economic circumstances combined with environmental determinism, what does that imply? Well, that means that the bourgeoisie are conditioned to one set of truths about what's reasonable and good. The proletariat are conditioned to an opposite set of truths about what's reasonable and good. Given their conditioning, there's no way for individuals of different classes to communicate effectively with each other. To understand each other's position is going to be impossible. To change each other's minds through reason, that will be impossible. Each side has been molded to embody an opposed set of beliefs. It follows then that for Marxism, if we go back to the issue of democratic republicanism, democratic process is just a pointless sham. So if we pause here and think about what democracy depends on, I mean, classic democracy theory presupposes the effectiveness of reason. We're saying you know, individual citizens, they can think for themselves, they can observe the facts, they can make judgments for themselves, they can learn from their experience, they can try one policy, realize that it's not working, or a candidate, they don't like that person, they can change their minds about the policy, or the candidate vote differently the next time they're open to argument, and we should have lots of arguments and discussions, etc. Marxism, however, rules all of that out on epistemological principle. Knowledge is conditioning. It's not autonomous, rational judgment. So, now in final consequence, it follows that when differently conditioned individuals meet, that is to say people from different classes, their conflict can be resolved only by forceful methods. Socialists can't argue capitalists into socialism. Socialists cannot, through reason, convince liberals to accept the dictatorship of the proletariat. They cannot objectively prevent, present rather evidence. They can't appeal to reason. Nobody can. Marxists can only take over by violence and remove their social enemies by force. And that is, accordingly, the biggest part of the explanation for the post-Marx and Engels socialist tradition of violence. Lenin and Stalin in Russia, Mao in China, Guzman in Peru, Pol Pot in Cambodia, Castro and Guevara in Cuba, the long, long list of Marxist and neo-Marxist terrorist groups that torture, blow up, or otherwise kill people indis promiscuously, indiscriminately, anything to try to precipitate the revolution. Politics is driven by philosophy. Marxism is very clear about this. In Marxism, we have a direct line from a metaphysical point about causality to a human nature point about plasticity to an epistemological point about knowledge as conditioning to a social ethics point about zero-sum conflicts of beliefs and values and then finally to a political point about necessary violent methods. And that is worth remembering in our generation when we're responding to and trying to understand left-inspired activists and want to be revolutionaries, whether they are true believer Marxists or neo-Marxist or some other evolved variation, all of them have absorbed the basic Marxist philosophy underlying the politics. And the point more generally is going to be that it's always worth remembering in analyzing any political issue or battle, we always need to look especially to the underlying philosophical issues. Join Professor Stephen Hicks on his Adventures in Postmodernism tour next March in Australia, where he'll be giving you his insights and lessons on the subject firsthand. Stephen Hicks will be appearing at The Concourse in Chatswood, New South Wales in Australia in March 2019. He'll be doing a talk on the evening of Friday, March 15th, starting at 7pm, and an all-day special event masterclass series starting at 9am the next day on Saturday the 16th of March, where he will delve even deeper into understanding postmodernism, its history, and teach valuable strategies to actually combat it. Reserve your tickets today by going to theconcourse.com.au, typing Stephen Hicks into the search bar and selecting the event to which you wish to attend. 
And while you're online, please leave a review for the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.